I swear to you, I swear, I know it's, this is going to seem like a lie, I had no intention of playing that character when I wrote it. Heil Hitler, you're going to be the best! Heil Hitler, you can do it! Look at me. I'm a brown supermodel, okay? It doesn't make any sense. Thor Ragnarok. Well, with Thor, I wanted to do something that felt different to the other films. You know, I wanted to do a good job. You know, I, it's the first time that I'd worked on someone else's IP, really, and it was, it's Thor. I think it was like the 17th movie they'd made, and they'd had nothing but consecutive hits the entire time. So it's no, my job is not to come in and say, I think this is how you guys need to be doing it. My job is to come in and go, what's the best I can do to help you make Thor the best that he can be. And I didn't think that all of Chris's talents had been utilized up until that point. I didn't think that the character was as interesting as it could be, because like looking at the comics, it's pop art, it's crazy, it's cosmic. You know, there's so many things that I had not seen in the first two films and wanted to explore. Obviously the Jack Kirby art and all of that, then even down to characters, which is a nice segue into my character, Korg. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Korg. I'm kind of like the leader in here. I'm made of rocks, as you can see, but don't let that intimidate you. You don't need to be afraid unless you're made of scissors. <laughs> just a little rock, paper, scissor joke for you. I just like the idea of playing this big rock guy who was Thor's buddy. He's like his sidekick. You know, I really wish I had my hammer. A hammer? Quite unique. It was made from this, this special metal from the heart of a dying star. And when I spun it really, really fast, it gave me the ability to fly. You wrote a hammer? No, I, I didn't ride the hammer. The hammer rode you on your back? No, 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 I, I used to spin it really fast and it, it would it would pull me off the- Oh my God, the hammer pulled you off? The ground, it would pull me off the ground, up into the air and I would fly. There's different types of the New Zealand accent, you know, and I based that on the Polynesian accent of like, mainly I was thinking about bouncers outside nightclubs, you know, growing up in New Zealand and always like this massive giant guys, but they're the most beautiful, humble, nice people you'll ever meet, you know, and like they're, and also why do they need to be aggressive? They just don't need to. It's like a wall of a person stopping you getting in. So why not be nice if you're that big, you know? So, you know, I've grown up around a lot of those guys and it's just like a, it's like a, it's just a voice and a style and it's just a sensibility that I've always found really like comforting to be around. Just being Polynesian as well. I just like the idea of having a character like that in an American studio film. I wasn't even sure if people would even understand my accent. I thought, well, maybe they'll probably make me revoice this or get someone else to do it because, you know, the voice is so over the top. Who the hell is going to understand this? But it's been amazing the fact that people can understand and also then grew to love that character. The damage is not too bad. As long as the foundations are still strong, we can rebuild this place. It will become a haven for all peoples and aliens of the universe. Def nah, those foundations are gone, sorry. Thor Love and Thunder. Korg is back in Love and Thunder. Again, it's me. How would I not crowbar myself in there, you know? I think it would have been a disservice. I can't even believe I'm talking like this about myself. I do think it would have been a disservice to the fans to not include Korg from this film. I thought that, you know, my life was complete when I worked with Kate Blanchett and that was one of the great experiences of my career. And then coming in to, to this new film, we've got Russell Crowe, uh, Christian Bale, Natalie Portman. You know, Natalie is someone I've admired for many years and I've always found her very funny in person and I've always like, enjoyed watching her work. I just was always wanted to work with her and when the opportunity came to bring Jane, Jane Foster back to the franchise, I jumped at that. And also just to focus on The Mighty Thor, the comic run by Jason Aaron, where she gets to pick up the hammer and becomes a superhero. And what's cooler? There's nothing cooler for a character like Jane Foster to then transform and evolve and become like, you know, to become a massive part of the of the story. And then Christian Bale, who, you know, look, listen, but personally between Christian and Russell, like, you know, those are probably two of my favorite actors. Let's see who you are. I take off your disguise. And flick. Oh, you flick too hard, damn it! get a chance to work with both of them, they're two of my heroes, and to work with both of them in the same film was just something else, you know. I've, I've adored Russell for many years. You know, I think I've watched Master and Commander probably 70 times. Russell's one of those, those guys who, you know you're in good hands with him when you're watching one of his films, you know, you're getting looked after. It's like, you know, it's like, there's very few people who are real stars 
like that, and I've always felt that about him. And then became friends with him in real life. You're in great hands as well. He's a great dude. Jojo Rabbit. So Caging Skies was the book that Jojo Rabbit is um, loosely based on. My mother had just read it. She gave me the book. She said, read this book. I think it would make a great film. But the way she described it is actually more like Jojo Rabbit. Because I read the book and it was nothing like the film that I made. It was like very dark. You know, there was like a lot of really intense, sad moments in it and it gets pretty twisted. Um, it's more of a kind of psychological thriller than anything and there was no comedy. It wasn't a, it wasn't a comedy. There was no imaginary Hitler. So all of that stuff I put in later on and I was, I was trying to think of like, how can I make this my own? How can I make this more of a Taika film? The heart of the book and what made it really special and what drew me in was this relationship between the boy and a girl that's being hidden by his mother um, in the house. You know, that really is the heart of the whole film. I wrote the first few drafts and I was really happy with the script. Then we started thinking, who would play this imaginary Hitler? Now this was about 2011 and we started sending it out to different people. I don't think a lot of actors even got to look at the script. Basically I think a lot of agents were like, hell no am I sending this to my client. There's no in way in hell that <laughs> I'm not gonna ruin my client's career by making him play Hitler. So I don't think a, you know, a lot of these people actually got to see it. And we were going to these actors because at the time, you know, to make a film like this, you know, you needed A-listers. You needed like, big names to be able to sell these films. What then happened is I went off and I made What We Do In The Shadows, Hunt For The World Of People, and Thor. I made three other films and just left that script on ice. And by the time I came back to it, the whole cinematic landscape had changed and you didn't need A-listers to sell your film anymore. You actually just needed good films. So Searchlight picked up the script and they said, we want to make it under one condition that you play Hitler. Poor Jojo. What's wrong, little man? Hi, Adolf. Want to tell me about that rabbit incident? What was all that about? They wanted me to kill it. I'm sorry. I couldn't. Don't worry about it. I couldn't care less. But now they call me a scared rabbit. Let them say whatever they want. People used to say a lot of nasty things about me. Oh, this guy's a lunatic. Oh, look at that psycho. He's going to get us all killed. I swear to you, I swear, I know it's, this is going to seem like a lie, I had no intention of playing that character when I wrote it. Look at me. I'm a brown supermodel, okay? It doesn't make any sense. It started, what they said started to make sense in that if you do get a massive actor to play Hitler in a small film about two kids and you know, them overcoming their differences and um, and intolerance and trying to make a beautiful film about love. It, the whole thing gets overshadowed when you have, you know, like a massive celebrity playing Hitler, you know, Denzel Washington as Hitler. It's just not gonna work, mate. Do not let her put you in a brain prison. That, dear Jojo, is one thing that cannot and must not ever, ever happen to a German. Do not let your German brain be bossed around. I won't let her boss my German brain around, mein Führer. Try not to. I did zero to no research about Hitler. I remember, I remember looking up books about Hitler on Amazon. I didn't want to spend the money because I was like, I was just out of principle. I don't want to spend money on this asshole. Then I was like, I don't even want to read about him. I don't care about his life. I don't care about why he did things. I don't care about what was behind, the motives behind anything. I just didn't care about him. I also wanted to ridicule him. I wanted to lambast him, you know, even beyond the grave. I was hoping that, you know, somehow like, you know, his spirit, what's left of it, that I could somehow just humiliate him and piss him off even more from the grave. I created the character based on just like ideas of like goofy best friend characters. There's nothing from Drop Dead Fred in this, but you know, that idea of this sort of like, a, or Beetlejuice, you know, the idea of an annoying best friend, fantasy best friend that a kid has. It's got to feel a little bit more in that vein where it's like, it's in this kid's head. It can't be a real depiction of Hitler because, you know, it's also, it's untrue. It wouldn't be in a kid's fantasy idea of who someone is. It's a fantasy that would never be exactly like the person. What we do in the shadows. The point is, Deacon, that you have not done the dishes for five years. Vladislav is right. It's unacceptable to have so many bloody dishes all over this bench like this. I'm so embarrassed when people come over here. Well, what does it matter? You bring them over, you kill them! Yeah. Jermaine and I, I think, started writing this in around 2004, maybe? We'd always intended to be in the film. 
we, sh we shot a little short version of this thing of what we do in the shadows in like 2005, and just to see like what the characters would be like, what you know, if we could sustain something just even for 25 minutes with these characters, and whether it would still be funny after 25 minutes. And then um, we cut that together and sort of made this little thing. And yeah, and we realized yeah we could probably like keep this idea going for maybe an hour and a half if we were lucky. I haven't washed this shower for about 20 years. That is something that needs to be done weekly. No, I know. Yeah, I think said... you know. It's just hard for me because I used to be yeah, royalty. For yeah. me to have to, I uh, you know, take the corpse out of the dryer. Over like the next sort of six years or so, we just like every couple of weeks a year, we would just like get back into it and just reopen up the script. Jermaine and I, the way that we work, we end we would end up like doing maybe a page a year. And then we ended up with 150 pages, so it took 150 years to write the script. Like any real smart filmmakers, we didn't show anyone, we just improvised the whole film. Well, that didn't go so great. Um, I hit the main artery. So yeah, it's a real mess in there. Um, on the upside, I think she had a really good time. Viago, I mean, I think just costume-wise, kind of got that Mr. Darcy sort of, like there's a little bit of interview with the vampire kind of going on there. But in terms of the character, Viago's basically just a mixture of C-3PO and my mother. Just the anal vampire who can't um, stand mess and wants everything to be structured and needs to have regimen and it has to make a chore wheel so that everyone keep on top of doing the dishes or vacuuming. Deacon on dishes and it still hasn't moved in five years. The only issue is like when you're a vampire uh, and you live forever, you can always put things off to the next day. So why bother cleaning on a Monday when you can clean on a Tuesday 10 years later? We'll all do our jobs starting with a certain Deacon. I will do my dishes! <laughs> I mean, I always prefer to work with my friends um, on Shadows. It was Jermaine and I. We surrounded ourselves with all of our other friends, you know, including Stu, who I went to high school with, and Jackie I went to high school with. I've known them since I was about 12 or 13. Yeah, Stu was a flatmate of mine for years. It's actually the best way of working, like, yeah, because you can give each other shit. You can, like, you know, pick on each other. And it's more like working with your family. You don't have to beat around the bush with stuff. You can just be honest. And yeah, they're the people I trust the most when um, asking for feedback or, you know, when I, if I've got a criticism, I know that it's coming from a place of love or that, you know, they actually are concerned about something in a scene or something. So, which is often, yeah, you know, if you don't know someone, you're a bit wary. And also actors um, are insane. Mandalorian. Stop that. Identify yourself. I am IG-11. I am this child's nurse droid and require that you remind him to me immediately. A nurse droid? I thought it was a hunter. Aren't IGs usually hunters? Yeah, well, definitely this one's a nurse. IG-11 is a droid. We don't say robot in the Star Wars universe because that's not appropriate. They're, he's a droid and it's a bounty hunter droid. They're a bounty hunter droid charged with, in this particular, you know, when we meet um, IG-11, charged with finding Grogu, the baby, the, we, the baby. It's not a baby Yoda. We just gotta stop saying baby Yoda. It's not baby Yoda. I'm sorry, nurse, but you're gonna have to get out of here. Are you refusing my request? No, I'm telling you to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That was unpleasant. I'm sorry you had to see that. It's again my own accent. I don't change my accent whenever I act. You might have noticed. Why bother? There are way too many Americans in the world anyway. Way too American actors. So you guys, you guys, you got that covered with that accent. Very few New Zealanders. That's the point of difference. I'm like a special little, sweet little thing. 
that you find in the forest. You go, what's this? It's like a magical little curiosity. That's my lane. That's where I'm at. I've got that covered. You guys stick to your, your lead acting, your lead role rules. You also directed an episode of Mandalorian. What was it like for you to sort of jump into the Star Wars universe and play around in that kind of sandbox? That was a very special thing for me to, to do that Mandalorian episode. The first day, I think we were working with about 70 stormtroopers and a TIE fighter. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that was one of the highlights of not only my career, but my life was to be walking around directing stormtroopers. And also to be, um, to be able to work and be doing that episode under the guidance of Favreau, who became a friend and became someone who's, who's been very supportive of my work. It was great because yeah, it was his idea. He'd written everything. And for me just to come in as a director when I didn't write it, it wasn't my concept, it was really nice. Just to kind of just to come in and go like, well, this is what I can offer you. Like, how can I like help with you know make keeping the flow of all the other episodes and um, and also what can I learn? Because so, uh, whenever I work, I want to learn something from someone, and I learned a lot on that one. Free guy. Who could forget 2021's <laughs> hit film Free Guy, in which I play the character Antoine, who was. Let's say kind of the bad guy. Good morning, sheeple! Ooh, you are fired! There is some concern with the bloody zombies. Retailers won't carry the game. No, it's out. Never even happened. Next. It's your lawyers. They need to get your deposition Speak. scheduled. Speak! Which lawsuit are we talking about? Millie. Millie Rusk. No sweat. That will never see the inside of a courtroom because she's got no proof and her ex-partner works for me. He owns a giant game company. He's got it all. He's got the clothes, the fashion. He's got the money. Again, one of my favorite types of characters. He's a bit of an asshole and a bit of an idiot. I love the idea of playing the CEO of this big company and also having no idea what that meant. And, you know, I don't know anything about gaming. And again, I was like, should I do any research into this world? Seems too hard. Seems like there's too much to learn and I don't, my brain's full. So uh, I didn't. I just played what I thought a character like that should be like, and I concentrate when I play something. I concentrate on like just the, the kind of relatable human elements, where it's like someone who obviously was picked on his entire life, and finally got some cash, and that's pretty much tells it all. They're always going to be, you know, it's like this, just like you got a chip on your shoulder, and you want to prove things to people, and you know, some people push it too far, and they just become major dicks. IPs and sequels. That is the thing that people want. Let me ask you a question. Okay. You love Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Mm -hmm. No. If you love Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I made Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I know that you love Kentucky Fried Chicken, why would I make another restaurant called, uh, I don't know, Albuquerque Boiled Turkey? Okay? Mm -hmm. Makes mm -hmm. no sense, homie. No sense. What am I going to give you? A sequel. Kentucky Fried Chicken Chicken? Part two. I didn't mean to improvise that much. It's just whenever people laugh, I mean, like, I'm a sucker for that. Cool. We're a team. Hey, we should come up with a catchphrase. All right. Okay, on three. One, two, three, get back to work! I'll just keep going until they tell me to stop. But that was good, now, those guys know how to, like, Sean knows how to feed someone who, who yeah, who's improvising, knows how to, you know, where to, yeah, which way to direct them, and a lot of people think that improvising is just talking, and just saying the first thing that comes to your head, and like, but actually it's, yeah, you know, you've gotta be aware of what's happening in the scene, and where you're trying to get the scene to go to, and you have gotta be having a conversation with someone. Most of improvising is listening to the other person, and just reacting to that, yeah, but a lot of people want, They've got some jokes in their head that they really want to say, and they're not listening to what you're taught you what you're saying. They're just waiting for their turn to tell the joke. But Sean's good at like creating that conversation in a scene where where the improvising actually makes sense and actually works and is usable, which is the main thing that you want. Our flag means death. Blackbeard is basically me with a fake big beard and fake wig on and and all these leather clothes. Guess what accent I'm doing? <laughs> Blackbeard, the original guy, was from Bristol in England. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like Stephen Merchant. I can't even get close to what that sounds like. Stephen Merchant, he sounds a bit like that. Can you imagine Blackbeard sounding like that? I can't even do that accent, and nor do I want to spend my precious time learning how to. Hello, everyone. I'm Blackbeard. Huge fan, sir. Huge. Well, that's lovely, but you don't need to say sir, all right? It's just Blackbeard. Yes, sir, Blackbeard, sir. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hello. Hey. Hello. Nice to meet you. Yes. Hi, how are you? Hey, look, I love all the rope. Everyone's wearing rope. Everyone's grubby as well. Filthy. Look at this bunch. <laughs> Wild characters on the high seas. What I found out from the extensive research I did, which was typing in 
Blackbeard into Wikipedia. It says, not much is known about him. I thought, that's all I need to know. We're done. We're done here. I don't need to, I don't need to be authentic. There's no one that's going to pick on me for, for getting it wrong. No one knew anything about him. They say his name maybe have been Edward Teach. There are other names that were given to him. They say maybe he come from Bristol. Maybe he actually grew up in Jamaica. No one knows anything about him. So it's open season on that character, um, I have to tell you. So I could do whatever I wanted. He could have been from New Zealand. No one fucking knew. It was just more fun to be able to play him as like, you know, a kind of like a grumpy version of me or like one of my uncles growing up. You know, I've, I've grown up around a lot of blackbeards. There's something about that character as well that I, I appreciated in that. It's about someone who's been, who's been doing something for about 20 years. He's got really good at it. Everyone wants him to keep going, but he's just getting slowly, more progressively pissed off with the industry and over it. If you were to show me the ways of an aristocrat, I could probably show you a thing or two about being a bloodthirsty pirate. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> you serious? So Reese and I have worked together, we've known each other for, I mean, over 20 years. We've always worked well together. There's just a sort of synchronicity and a connection between our brains and the way that we act or improvise. We're, we always seem in tune. Our flag means death. Um, that was no different. We you know, came in and we slotted into our roles. And it was interesting for us, two old friends playing two people who are in love, you know, on the high seas in the 1700s. Oh, that lovely piece of silk you have there. Oh, this teddy old thing. Well, sometimes the old things are the best things. May I? There we go. Look at that. You wear fine things well. It's just weird to kind of pretend that you're romantically interested in your old friend. But then all the scenes that we did together were my favorite ones because we get, we just got to play and just, you know, sit around and just play with words. Look at that, there's one, two, nine guns all over him. Nine guns? That's two. I have, I, I have one gun and one knife, just like everyone else. Yeah. So far I've played this, you know, ridiculous, effeminate vampire based on my mum, Hitler. Um, I've played my dad in the film. I've played a hot priest twice, but they were brothers. So it wasn't the same character. Blackbeard, asshole owner of a game tech company. Droid. So every single one has been pretty different. That makes me happy because I just don't want to ever feel like if I'm, if I'm repeating myself too much, and even with my filmmaking, I feel like the charm or like the magic started to go out of what I'm doing. So my decisions really are based on, and even when I'm making films, it's like, what's gonna keep me interested? What makes me feel nervous? It's just about continuing to keep myself interested. And I mean, I, the reason I really, if I'm honest, getting into any of this is so I can just play different roles and do, you know, and just play around.